Welcome to the West End Video Newsletter. Tonight we're going to do a little something. We've had uh, some well-named guests in uh, the last three or four shows. But tonight we're going to do... People keep asking me about uh, Herb Gans. Now, Herb Gans wrote a book called Urban Villages. And I was thinking about it. And uh, we can't get him up here because he's, he's head of uh, sociology at Columbia University. And he just doesn't travel all that well. He just doesn't come out. But he did come up about seven years ago. Uh, and he dedicated the West End exhibit at the old at the old State House, and he gave a, a talk. So we're going to take about a half an hour of that talk today, and we're going to run it, and we're going to uh, show you what Herb Gann said about his, his landmark book, Urban Villages, and uh, what he thought about the West End because he lived there a year before uh, it all happened, and he in that year before he took pictures and wrote a book. And uh, here it is. He'll, he'll, he'll give you a little bit of a rundown about the West End, especially you urban planners and architects and so forth and so on that, that deal with urban planning. Uh, he's, one, he's one of the, the loudest voices about taking care of community. And uh, here we go. I guess you can roll tape. And we're delighted she's actually with us here tonight and is going to introduce Dr. Gantz momentarily. But I have the privilege of introducing Jane Holtz K. And like Professor Gantz and myself, you might agree that you've never met her, but we've all read her. So in a minute, we will actually also get to meet her. Um, Jane Holtz Kay is the architecture critic for The Nation. She is the author of two books and currently working on a third book. She's the author of Lost Boston, 1980, and Preserving New England in 1986. Her current work is entitled Carbound, Ending the Auto Age. She's a regular contributor to the Boston Globe and the New York Times. She's the critic at large for the publications Architecture and Landscape Architecture. Uh, Jane Holtz Kay has taught at Harvard University and Boston University, um, and we're welcome her tonight to introduce our very distinguished speaker, Ms. Kay. It's very nice to be with you all to celebrate the reincarnation of the old State House which is the only thing here, I think, which, de which needs no introduction. But also, um, especially to welcome Professor Gans, who is a uh, founding father, if one's allowed to say this, in such an old organization of a very humane and humanistic way of approaching preservation, which was not the way Bostonians always thought of their past or their history. Um, but in terms of many of us here, the kind of validation that Professor Gans gave not only to high art and high history, but to low art and low history, as the West End was clearly perceived in the period when it was flattened, is very important to very many of us, um, because he taught us that these, this kind of neighborhood, which is so typical of so many of our neighborhoods, um, was a repository of the past and of our identities in a very meaningful way. And any number of us also came to this period of time and way of viewing the past as people who viewed what was happening in the West End as an outrage, but until we read the urban villages, probably never realized that it was a national and larger outrage and trespass on the way we were and who we were. Um, and that approach to history and sociology um, was of the way Professor Gant launched a career of that kind of caretaking, which was a rare blend and remains a rare blend, I think, of scholarship and compassion, which in some ways is as impressive as the more formal resume, which um, I have here, which um, describes Professor Gant as a Robert F. Lind Professor of Sociology at Columbia and the author of eight books, uh, including the Levitt Town is Popular Culture and High Culture, Deciding What's New, and People, Plans, and Policies, his most recent book, um, 
as well as his current studies of the impact of the conception of the underclass and the undeserving poor um, on anti-poverty policy in America in general. Uh, this latest book, however, it seems to me, People, Plans, and Policy, if I have the trinity in the right order, um, seems to me like so many of these books, a kind of primer of the way we all feel and the way most of America has not felt in the last generation about viewing cities and people and policies. Um, though we can visualize um, that more holistic, to use a word that's out of the historic preservation vocabulary very often, attitude towards the past. I think it's taken Professor Gans's kind of writing and thinking to make us realize its worth and importance. And I am therefore pleased to welcome this Bostonian by adoption, Professor Gans. I'm flattered to be here. I'm flattered by the introductions. Having just been at the exhibit, which is marvelous, I feel a little bit like a phony. I'm not a real West Ender. And in some ways, I wish a real West Ender were giving this talk instead of me. And I guess if I had the choice, it would be my old friend, the writer, painter, Joe Caruso, an old West Ender uh, for many, many years. He's very sick now, but I would like to take the liberty of dedicating this lecture to him. Yeah, the, we have a, whoops, I think I've broken the technology. Uh, I think I be, just better move over here. <coughs> Miss Cage, do you understand what this is all about, the acoustics up here? <laughs> uh, well, let me, let me just scream a bit uh, and see if I can do that. If somebody had bet me in 1962 uh, that someday there would be a museum exhibit, and a lecture service to remember and to celebrate the West End and the people who lived there, I would have laughed, and then I would have cried. After all, in 1962, Boston was celebrating that it had torn down the West End, an area that was officially judged to be detrimental, in quotes, to health, to the health, safety, morals, and welfare of the inhabitants to use the official jargon of that time. And Boston was celebrating also that it had relocated, in quotes, the West Enders from their slums, in quotes, into safe and sanitary housing, also in quotes, uh, more of the jargon of the times, in order to replace them with a well-planned, high-income neighborhood, and it goes without saying, a high-income population. What Boston had actually done, however, uh, was to tear down a vital low-rent district occupied by hard-working, law-abiding, moderate income and poor people who benefited from the low rents in the West End, from the central location, and from the relatives and familiar neighbors who were living around the corner. Moreover, Boston had in fact not relocated very many at all since most West Enders had to relocate themselves, almost always at much higher rents, which cut further into tight family budgets, and in farther away areas, which in the transportation cut further into tight family budgets. The city had also brought about the destruction of neighborhood businesses, institutions, and of course the livelihoods of people involved in these. In many cases, as Mark Fried and his colleagues discovered later, the displacement and the destruction had produced depression among the ex-residents of the West End, premature death among the older folk uh, who were lost outside the West End. And to rub it in some more, the displaced were subsidizing by their involuntary departure, not to mention their tax monies, the construction on subsidized land of a high-income housing project on the now empty land of the West End. Now it is true that when the West End was torn down it had a number of slummy buildings. There were also some alley blocks with lots of vacant and dilapidated buildings 
But some of these, and we don't know the exact number, were created by the, depart by the announcement in 1953 by the Boston Redevelopment Authority that it, that it had decided and had gotten federal approval to tear down the West End. And of course, at that point, all the landlords stopped investing. Young people who had planned to stay moved away. Uh, buildings became vacant, and the alley dwellings, which were not, uh, which were the poorest of the housing, uh, emptied first. There was also some crime and delinquency in the area, and of course, poverty, as already mentioned, and the crime and delinquency and the poverty were all mentioned to justify the demolition of the area. But of course, you don't make people less poor uh, by forcing them out of their neighborhood and forcing them to pay higher rents. But this is what Boston did. Now, how could all this have happened? Talking about it 30 years later t sounds totally insane, but it happened. And it was done by rational, in most cases, well-meaning people, by government officials here in Washington. How did it all happen? Urban renewal began officially as a federal project in 1949. But it, that project, that program had been the outcome of many decades of lobbying of the federal government and of local governments by national and big city realtors, builders, developers, uh, downtown property interests who wanted to tear down low-income areas near the downtown uh, for so-called higher uses. And again, higher uses is in quotes. And higher uses, when translated into plain English, meant more prestigious and profitable residents or other occupants, some fancy shoppers for the downtown stores, more jobs for construction workers and therefore for the unions, more profits for developers, obviously more things to do, more taxes for the city, and last but hardly least, some campaign funds and party contributions from the developers to the politicians. And that is an unexpurgated translation of higher uses. In Boston, the idea of urban renewal fell on very ripe ground, as you will read in the exhibit itself. In the early 1950s, Boston's political, civic, and economic leadership, like those of many of an other old, economically declining city, seeing the growth of post-war suburbia all around them, feared that there would be further economic decline of the city, uh, a phenomenon they had not previously really anticipated because American cities had been growing decade after decade until before World, until the Depression. And seeing this decline, seeing this growth of suburbia, uh, they looked for a magic solution. And that magic solution, and the word magic is not theirs, but mine, they looked for a fast, a quick, easy fix, which is what politicians have to do if they want to get reelected in the 1950s as now. And what they decided to do was to rebuild and to add to downtown in the belief, without any evidence whatsoever, that this would stem the decline of the entire city. And again, the Boston leadership was not distinctive, it was not unique. The same magic solution was sought in other cities, including mine. In fact, New York and Robert Moses provided some of the leadership uh, for the other cities. Uh, the federal government had also been persuaded of this magic solution and was ready to sell developers cleared land at below market prices to encourage new development and to pay for most of the costs of the clearance, even though there was still no evidence of any kind that subsidizing downtown in this way would do anything uh, for the city as a whole. It might do things for downtown. There was no evidence that it would do things for the city as a whole. And in those politically primitive days, it's sad to say, even liberal Democrats had no problem with this analysis and with this magic solution. Deciding that a poor or working class area was a dangerous slum full of socially undesirable people seemed to go with the kind of upper middle and upper class liberalism of the day and dispersing them all over the place would be a liberal solution. So this, this magic solution was politically acceptable to just about everybody, except maybe the libertarians who said government money shouldn't be spent for this kind of thing. 
And as I recall, the three or four libertarians that they were in the woodwork here as elsewhere uh, were against the removal for that reason. With hindsight, I suppose one can ask if these people like the West Enders were undesirable, why city leaders and the city as a whole would want such undesirables dispersed all over, the, all over the city. Wouldn't they be smarter to keep them bottled up in their slums where they couldn't infect the rest of the city? But and while this was this idea of bottling them up uh, was around American social thought in the 19th century before the invention of sanitation, public sanitation and public health when in order to prevent epidemics you had to make sure that the, the very poor were bottled up, that they couldn't get near the middle and upper classes. Ever since public sanitation had been invented, public health had been invented, uh, medical, the medical progress had begun against the uh, epidemics, uh, there had been a doctrine in America of reducing poverty and improving the lives of the poor, not by giving them money, but by tearing down their housing and sending them elsewhere. Again, it was not a very thoughtful or a sensible solution if one looks at it in the cold light of day many years later, but the belief was genuine. The feeling was that, uh, that slums caused slum dwellers, that good people, once they were living in something called slums, became bad, that if you remove them from these slums, they would become good again. And so genuine, it was a belief of genuine American innocence of the old style, American naivete. If you want to be nasty, you can call it American mindlessness, upper, upper class civic reform mindlessness, of which we have all kinds of, uh, of, kinds of examples in our history, uh, of well-meaning but not very well-informed uh, upper class civic and political leaders. But of course, at the same time and behind them, there were other people with other motives. The people who wanted to replace the poor with higher uses uh, of the kind I have already mentioned. Now, quite often, the urban renewal areas uh, were racial ghettos. And then the higher uses also meant getting the blacks away from downtown. Indeed, urban renewal was known as Negro removal, uh, because about 80% of all urban renewal projects were removing blacks uh, from the downtowns of American cities. And the West End was distinctive in that it was one of the few largely white areas to be torn down under the urban renewal program. There were other white areas in Boston, of course, poorer uh, than the West End, with worse housing than the West End in some respects. Uh, Chelsea, Charlestown, which I was told today is becoming a gentrified uh, condominium neighborhood. It was a very poor area in the 1950s. Even the South End. But all these were really too far away from downtown to suit the developers. Others, like the North End, and the North End particularly, were untouchable. Mostly because North, the North End had already sacrificed a third of its area to the Central Artery. Where the Central Artery now goes, there was once the North End. This was before my time, too. Uh, and the North End had enough political power to say no more. The West End had no political power for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into now, which I think somebody will talk about later in this lecture series. And so the West End became the victim. The West Enders had a hard time understanding why they were picked, because everybody knew that West End housing was better than North End housing. The housing the apartments were newer, the rooms were bigger, there were fewer shared toilets, uh, and there were fewer cold water flats. And in fact, one of the things I remember talking today with old West Enders was when the West End was being, when the relocation time came, people said, we don't want to go back to the North End. We came from there. We improved ourselves by going to the West End. Please, not the North End again. Again, this is the old North End, the pre-gentrified North End, the North End that uh, now exists only in the picture books and on some of the side streets. But to the planners of that era, the North End uh, was untouchable politically. They knew where their bread was buttered on. We all do. The West End was crime-ridden, poor, delinquent. The housing was obsolescent, and there was a long string of 
reasons why it was obsolescent. Uh, and so it was officially called a slum, and it met all the federal definitions of a slum. And so when the Boston planners came to Washington to, uh, with a plan, and Washington was very eager to get slum clearance going, uh, the West End qualified quite easily. And again, there was agreement here for many others in downtown Boston, including politicians, civic and religious leaders, newspaper editors. In fact, even the boards of the settlement houses in the West End believed that if the West Enders could get out of the slum, they would all do better. And that was, I think, one of the things that hurt the West Enders. Uh, those who, who still went to the settlement houses hurt them uh, most, because here were their own settlement house leaders not their own leaders, but the leaders of the settlement houses in their area saying, well, this is a terrible neighborhood. Uh, let's get these people out of there and make their lives better. Uh, and of course, much of the population of Boston vicariously was involved in this process. Uh, they didn't go into the West End. There was no reason to go into it. There was nothing there for, uh, there were no tourist attractions. There was freedom trailers in the North End. Uh, there may be a couple of cafeterias and a bakery that uh, Italians from everywhere came to, uh, but the ordinary Bostonian didn't come to the West End. Uh, and the newspapers were telling him all kinds of things, and the, the, the word that will always stick in my mind was that some writer said the West End was a, had, was a cesspool, had always been a cesspool, and should have been torn down 50 years ago. Uh, and so the image of the West End as, as a slum, as a cesspool, uh, since there were Italians there, uh, Italians were thought to be dangerous in those days. Everybody knew that, you know, they were all mafioso. If they were not mafioso, they carried knives anyway, because they were Italians. Uh, things have changed in America for the better in some respects in the last 30 years, or the last 40 years. But I think there was general public support for the uh, demolition of the West End. Because uh, again, people hadn't been there, they didn't know what the people were like. Uh, there was no reason to be against it, and everybody said it would be good for the city. I don't want to embarrass anybody by digging out old clippings and saying what respected newspapers and magazines and authors had to say about the West End. I won't do that. Uh, because nobody was unusual here. It was general consensus. It was common wisdom. Although, again, looking back now, uh, it was class bias by the rich against the poor. And to some of us in sociology are trained to understand class a little better uh, than uh, non-sociologists, especially in those days. Uh, and of course, the West Enders themselves knew exactly what was going on. Uh, poor people are generally very sophisticated about the class structure of American society, more sophisticated than many sociologists. And they knew pretty well what was going on. They made it more conspiratorial than it really was. Uh, they couldn't understand the good intentions of the upper classes who wanted to get them out of their slum neighborhood. Uh, but they also knew that in the end, they would lose and the rich would win. Also, and this is something that I'm just learning because I'm doing some research on the history of, of poverty in America, uh, the poor have long served as scapegoats in America for economic decline. And in the 50s, they were not only scapegoats, they were also an obstacle. If they were moved, then there would be growth. Get rid of the poor and a hundred buildings will bloom, to paraphrase an old Chinese uh, communist who's now thankfully dead. Moreover, there were not enough blacks to serve that scapegoat function in Boston or near Boston downtown. And so the West Enders, the Italians and the Poles, uh, the Albanians and the handful of Jews that were left served that function instead. And in retrospect, uh, maligning the West Enders seems to me to, uh, to have been a kind of mass delusion. Uh, and we all are subject to mass delusions. At the time, uh, again looking back, America and Russia was involved in a mutual mass delusion in which both countries spent themselves into poverty 
uh, by a Cold War that was totally unnecessary, and, and a hot part of a Cold War that was in the end totally unnecessary. Neither side wanted it. Each side thought the other wanted it. Again, an international scale mass delusion. The West End was a local mass delusion. I can re read off a list of New York mass delusions, uh, uh, and we still have them. Uh, and we still have scapegoats. And at the moment, it's an imaginary population called not slum dwellers as in the 50s, but underclass. If we're attacking the West End now, it would not be called a, they would not be called slum dwellers, they would be called an underclass. Same fantasies, same delusions as here. That these are dangerous people simply because they don't have any money. Um, and again, some can find statistics because their rates of crime and delinquency are higher than the middle class, uh, and they are. But uh, if the rates are higher, the majority in, in all these neighborhoods have always been law-abiding. And those kinds of statistics uh, don't get so much publicity. And also urban renewal is, is dead and gone, obviously, in America. But we still dare tear down or abandon or otherwise find ways of reducing the amount of low-cost housing in our cities. And now we're creating homelessness and beggars. In, in, in the old affluent days, we simply re, uh, produced displaced people whom we sent off somewhere else. Now the supply of low-cost housing is, is down to zero, and we're producing homelessness and beggars, uh, which hurts not only them, but the quality of life for all, for all the rest of us in all, this, in all other cities. And of course, this in turn then drives more people, more capital into the suburbs and beyond the suburbs and what some of the journalists now call the edge cities. It is easier to blame the poor and to find scapegoats than to spend money to help them. It's easier to find scapegoats and blame the poor than to build more low-income housing. But one has to object every time it happens, whatever form it happens, in the hope, which may be total another, maybe a mass delusion or an individual delusion on my part, that if you say it often enough, and if enough of us say it often enough, that someday we won't do that anymore. Okay, that was Herbert Gans. Uh, welcome back, and that was Herbert Gans, uh, <coughs> who was a well-respected sociologist. Uh, he's, he is in the same class as Jane Jacobs, and Jane Jacobs, who wrote uh, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, who, the, who has just had a big uh, festival up in Toronto, I think about two months ago, they were of the same class, and uh, they have the same reputation. They're two of the great sociologists in the last uh, 50 years. And uh, that was only part of his uh, speech at that time. Someday when uh, we have more time, we will show you the second half of it. Because he's really interesting. He, he knows what happened at that era, and he can give you a rundown. And uh, he, was, uh, he watched it all with a professional eye because he was a trained sociologist. And uh, he came to the conclusion that the West End was a great place to be, uh, and they shouldn't have turned, uh, tore it down. Be that as may, it's gone. So see you at the next West End video newsletter. <laughs>